Hello, everyone, and welcome to session number seven of Prodigal Church. I decided to mix it up, be in a different location, the church this time, and uh, just glad you tuned in as we continue our way through 1 Corinthians. And uh, uh, here we are during, during Holy Week this week for this session. Uh, maybe you'll watch this later in the future, and, and that won't mean as much to you, but uh, just a real call for, for self-sacrifice. Uh, and that, that we are sinners and need a Savior. As we approach a, an interesting passage of Scripture, a very important passage of Scripture for the church, because uh, today we're going to get into um, uh, a whole section on marriage, on marriage, uh, questions related to it, and uh, in it it gets addressed like nowhere else in the New Testament. Not, not fully, uh, uh, and really uh, the, the section functions as Kind of guidelines aside from verse 10 uh, not so much as mandates but guidelines and helpful guidelines for christians to live by so let's let's just start off with with the word of prayer uh, lord we come before you today i just pray that you would help us to understand more about you i pray for uh, all the marriages in our church i pray for the uh, the marriages uh, all over i pray that people would be faithful and committed to one another, uh, loving each other, that men would uh, love their wives and wives would love their husbands, or that we would have strong uh, marriages and families uh, for kids to look up to. Lord, we lift these things up to you right now. Lord, I pray that as we get into your word that you would help us understand more about it, that we'd be drawn closer to you and that we'd find encouragement, strength, and even be challenged in a healthy way as we approach the scriptures. In Jesus' name we come. Amen. Amen. So uh, right now we're getting into uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, you can go to, to, that, to that chapter, flip it open, follow along uh, with me. We'll be tapping into different uh, aspects of it. But uh, what you should know, just a bit of a backdrop here, is that from chapter 7 all the way up to almost the end of uh, the last chapter, verses 12, pretty much through the rest of the book, uh, Paul is, is responding to the letter that the Corinthians gave him. And so we're now, in a sense, in, part, in the second part of the letter. Uh, and so, as we're soon going to read, chapter 7 begins with, Now for the matters you wrote about. You can read those words in different sections through the rest of the letter. Uh, they come up in chapter 8, verse 1. Now about food sacrificed to idols. Chapters 12, verse 1. Now about gifts of the Spirit. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now about the collection for the Lord's people. I mean, he uses those words now about, throughout, to correct their thinking. To correct, this is important. Uh, Dr. Fee, a leading commentary on, uh, on Corinthians, he's probably right in suggesting that Paul just isn't answering questions. Some think that Paul, they sent him a letter just answering questions that they had about the church. He's not just answering uh, questions. It's more likely that he's correcting their disagreements uh, that they had with his first letter written to him. And so, remember, uh, Paul wrote a letter to them. There's a letter before 1 Corinthians. There's 1 and 2 Corinthians of uh, first letter we have to Corinthians, the second letter, but there's another letter that we don't have that he had already written to the church. We know that's the case in chapter 5, verse 9. So based on that letter, they respond to Paul, wrote back to him, and this letter is in response to what they wrote to him. And the idea here from Dr. Fee is that when they responded to Paul, they just disagreed with what he said, and it got into an argument. That the letter they would have gotten from the Corinthians, we know what it came from, uh, two guys, Stephan Stephanus and Fortunatus, uh, chapter 16, verse 17, they come up, and from reports that he had heard from Chloe's household. The church is a mess. Uh, Paul's authority as the apostles in, uh, is being contended by them. They don't think that he's right. They think they are wiser than he is and uh, have more wisdom than he does. And so Paul is writing to correct their thinking. So from chapter 7 to 16, he's going to get right into the substantive issues that uh, 
the church thinks that he's wrong on based on other correspondence that unfortunately we, we don't have. So what it shows us is that there's a tension. We've talked about this as we've been going through 1 Corinthians. There's a tension in the letter. I mean, he has a whole church that's basically moving in the wrong direction, just like the church in Galatia. You can read about that in Galatians. Uh, moving toward positions that actually threaten the gospel itself. And so it's worth noting, Paul is fighting for this church and that's in rebellion to him and in the ways of God. They're very much a prodigal church. He's calling him back uh, to, to, to calling them back to Christ and, and the right way of, of thinking, of living, of believing, and so on. Paul is fighting for this church. You know, and when I when I think about that dynamic, we must always be careful that we don't just do what the culture around us teaches us to do, teaches us to believe, teaches us how to behave. That's not who we are as Christians. Because this church is very much being influenced by the ways of life in Corinth and in their day and age. And Paul's coming with the gospel saying, you're, you're going down the wrong track. I know you feel convinced that you're going the right way, but you're not. We are called to follow the way and teachings of Jesus Christ, even if they are opposed by the culture, even if certain Christian groups are to uphold them as from God, even though they're not like what was happening in this church. A culture that can infect our own hearts as well. Remember, a little bit of yeast can ruin the whole batch of dough that you're making. What we believe in and how we live in terms of our conduct as a lifestyle that the world is watching as a church together, as individuals, is worth fighting for. And it really comes out to me from the Apostle Paul. And so I, I just appreciate his love for the church that comes out in this letter. Like the the father, the father in the peril of the prodigal son, when the son came home, the father's arms were wide open. Wide open. And so, you know, we, we wanna we wanna have that same passion for one another and for the gospel that, that he did. For the matter you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. The husband should, should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a, was, if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. 
But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband, or how do you know, husband, how, whether you will save your wife? Verse 17. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called in Christ is when called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. These verses are quite interesting. Got a lot going on there. A lot of practical stuff happening. Uh, has to do with issues of being married and being single. C comes up. What happens here is Paul. Paul doesn't give a full-on discussion of marriage. You got to go to other passages with Paul, uh, and other letters, and other other passages within the Bible. Um, but he does respond theologically and pastorally to actual things that were going on within the church. Um, what he does in that sense is he gives guidance, like I mentioned earlier, on these matters. And while tapping into uh, situations that's not discussed any results in Scripture, for example, what if you are a believer married to an unbeliever, and what should you do? So a couple of... Uh, Truths to highlight as just walking through the passage. Uh, there's more there through the end of chapter 7. I'm just going to get to the first 24 verses in a very, very general and brief way. But So, as we talked about in, in another session or two, Paul prohibited sexual immorality. And we get into describing what that means according to Paul and, and the Judeo-Christian understanding. So they would be wondering, as, as converts, as followers of Christ, if, if sexual intercourse was permitted at all. And best just not to do it at all. And the answer is yes, it is permitted. So what seems to be going on here in light of the way it's written is the abuse of sexual relations within a marriage. What to do if you come to faith, if you were married or if you're not, if you're a widow or if you weren't. One of the things to appreciate, one commentator uh, wrote this, is that there was possibly some group of what they called eschatological women in the church who thought that in light of Paul, some of Paul's teachings and the, the letter he'd written, that, that sex, even within the confines of marriage, should be avoided or left for the sake of Christ and the future resurrection, that's why the word eschatological means the future kind of end times, that since it's not going to matter, that we, and it should be abstained in the present. That's come up in the church through periods of time as well. But so, so just looking at the first um, seven verses, a couple things kind of come out there. Uh, the first is that we learn that marriage is good. So he, he prohibits sexual immorality, but within the confines of marriage, a man and woman coming together, um, it, it's good. Marriage is good. It comes out in verse 1. It is good for a man uh, not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's what they were asking about. Like uh, He says, since sexual morality is occur, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, each woman with her own husband. So marriage is, marriage is good in and of itself, 
And the second thing there is that sexual relations within a marriage is good and to be kept. And to be kept. So there is to be no abstinence in marriage. Paul does say, if, if you read a little later on, that if both consent, it must only be to get closer to God and for a limited period of time with the concession given, then they must come back together again, lest they be tempted by Satan. That idea of, of abstaining within a marriage actually comes up in the Old Testament. Uh, Exodus 19, 15 is one verse, as well as 1 Samuel 21, verses 4 to 6. Uh, marriage is good. Sexual relations are good and to be kept within the marriage. That's really important. Oftentimes when you start to see a marriage wander off, one or both couples will start to look for sexual relations outside of that marriage union and nothing's happening at home. So there's some real help there in terms of you know, marriage for, for all of us. It says here that you know, the wife does not have authority over her husband, but over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. There's a commitment, a covenant made to be there for them in that way. Another thing that comes up is that singleness, being single or celibate, is encouraged by Paul. We kind of downplay it in our culture. Only if one has the gift to do it. That comes up in verse 7. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, the other has that gift. So singleness is encouraged if you have the gift. And by implication, marriage is a gift. If you have it or if you don't have this gift. So what he's saying isn't that you know being single is better than being married. And some church traditions have actually put that in place. Uh, in some denominations, I couldn't be a minister unless I was, I was single. Um, as if somebody who is celibate is more spiritual than somebody who is married. And that would be to misunderstand Paul in this passage. It's only in the context that the person has this gift, this charismata, this gracious gift from God. What he's saying that if you have the gift like he does, then, then live a single life and dedicate your, your whole life to the Lord. And in that singleness, we can never underestimate the power and the depths of friendships within the church and how important they are. I mean, one of the diseases of our culture in the West is, is individualism and how we, we each want to do our own thing in our own way and the depth of relationships just aren't there the way they were in New Testament times. Not always. I mean, they have, they're having struggles in this church, but, but um, you know, we want to do things together as a church family. And it's so important for you to get connected to a church um, and have close relationships with, with other people, friends with other people, friendships with other people. Um, so just a couple of points there. Another point that comes out a little bit later on, um, uh, right, verses 10 to, to 14, and that's the issue of divorce. And what comes out here in Paul is that divorce is to be avoided for Christians, like if two Christians are married, they should stay married, or mixed relationships. So if, if one's a Christian and one isn't, or one's a believer, or one's an unbeliever, um, ideally there would be no divorce. Of course, any time you do it, you talk about a subject like that, you got to go to all of the all of the scriptures to understand uh, what they're saying on divorce. This is not the final word on divorce. There are passages where God does permit it in the case of sexual marital unfaithfulness, but otherwise, um, if you're married, you should stay stay married and. I do want to, there's something important to say here. It's come up to me several times since I've been a minister, but in pastoral ministry for the 15, 20 years now, but 
People will often come and say things to me like, I prayed about it, and I know God doesn't want me to do this anymore. I prayed about it, and so blah, blah, blah. I prayed about it. Okay. I pray about a lot of things too. But the scriptures and the words of the apostle and the apostles uh, are revealed truth from God. You and I are not wiser than God. So if we're doing something that clearly is not what God wants us to do, for example, the Bible says thou shall not steal. Well, I can't go home and say, well, you know, I prayed about it, and uh, I know that my family really needs something, so I'm going to go steal some money. You know, I prayed about it, and, and I really love my kid. I can't afford something, so I'm going to go steal something from the Walmart. We have a way of justifying the sin that's still sin and is still not something we should do. There's other means of provision, other means of doing things. I know life gets difficult. That, that was a, an economic, financial example. But a lot of us would look at that and say, well, yeah, you shouldn't steal. People will do that when it comes to marriage. People do that when it comes to divorce. People will do that when it comes to relationships. And I know we might feel a certain way and perhaps have prayed about it, um, but that's where we need God's direction and, and, and revelation that comes through Scripture. It comes through Scripture and comes from the apostles. Otherwise, what's happening, you know what's happening when we do that? We're becoming like the Corinthians who are saying, I'm wiser than God. I have this newfound knowledge that God didn't know about or doesn't know about in my life, and I can do kind of what's best for me. It's a temptation we all face, even ministers face it, um, but at the end of the day, we want to come down to the Word of God, hear what God is saying, and live that out. Really, when it comes to, to marriage, um, it's a call to holiness, not so much happiness. Happiness happens and it comes, but, but well, I'll give an example. In the, in the Catholic tradition, uh, they see marriage as a sacrament, which means sort of a, a dispensation of God's grace that, that changes the person. And I would agree. I have to agree with that on, on many levels, not on all, but on many levels, in, in this sense that, that your being married at the end of the day is helping you grow closer to God and become more like Christ. It's not always about happiness, feeling the best. Some, sometimes marriage gets difficult. It can be extremely difficult. But what is God teaching you or teaching me as we're walking with this person? Sometimes if we're divorcing and divorcing again and divorcing again, it may just be that you're running from yourself. What are the things that I need to change? I mean, we're in the middle of Holy Week, and, and I can't say my spouse is a sinner, so I can't be around her. I mean... I'm a sinner, then why did Jesus die for me? The marriage in our culture is very selfish. When marriage is defined by Scripture, it's supposed to be very selfless. Selfless for both parties. Again, when it gets really bad on one side where there's faithfulness and abuse, um, then you know, exceptions can be made, and, and we're made by God in the Old Testament, and even Jesus talks about that, but... But understand marriage more as a call to holiness and less as the Hollywood form of, of, uh, of happiness. And, and I think in that you find a greater level of happiness as you draw closer to God. I'm, I'm actually taking a lot of that. It's not my own stuff. That comes from a guy named Gary Thomas. He wrote a book called Sacred Marriage. Uh, some wonderful information in there that... Um, That'd be very helpful. If you want a copy of it, just contact the church. I can make sure you get one. It's a wonderful book. It was a bestseller. Uh, but it, marriage is sacred. It's a call to holiness for both parties. And that takes hard work. The, the big lesson, so far with all that I've read in, in Corinthians, but the big lesson...
comes out of verses uh, 17 to 20, and it's to remain as you are, to remain as you are. And you think, what's Paul talking about? What's happening is people are coming to faith in Christ in Corinth, and they're trying to, they're trying to learn what it's like to follow this Jesus. And, and there, there's confusion all around, the same thing that goes on today. Um, some people are saying, well, okay, I should get married if I'm single, and if I'm, if I'm married, I shouldn't get I should you know, not have sexual relations or perhaps should become single or if I'm, if I'm with an unbelieving um, spouse, I should leave them. The overall principle that ties everything together that Paul has been saying verse seven, is verse 17. Each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Verse 20. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. So what's happening is they're, they're free in Christ. They're learning about a coming resurrection and a return from the Lord Jesus. And there's a bigger kingdom than what's going on in the world. They're thinking, well, okay, what do I do now? What Paul is saying is an important principle to just... to, to Basically, an old line, to blossom where God has planted you. To blossom where God has planted you. You know, you're a father, you're a mother, husband, wife, child, uncle, I mean, stepson. As you're walking with Jesus in that situation, remain faithful to those people that God has placed around you. Blossom where you are planted, as the line, the line goes. So you serve God wherever you are and the relationships that you are in. And, um, and what I really hear there, again, I go back to what I said earlier about marriage, is I hear from Paul a call to holiness. A call to holiness to serve where God has placed you, to put him first, to love your neighbor, and to really live out the gospel where you're at. I just I want to close off by reading 1 Corinthians 13 with that in mind, talking about marriage, even being single, or you know the relationships that we are in and, and trying to be faithful to God. Here's some characteristics, some holy living that we can to follow. Love is patient, so be patient, right? Love is kind, so be kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. Isn't that beautiful? I read that at weddings all the time. That's divine love. That kind of love comes from God. It's a Holy Spirit love where we need His help to do it. And, and, and to, to be that kind of person to other people wherever God has placed us, whatever the relationship dynamic is life, we want to be salt and light for the gospel for jesus that doesn't mean that every relationship is one that you should stay in right you should get married there's again paul's the same one who will say to avoid sexual immorality so some things are off limits but in the confines of marriage and singleness for the christian uh, whether you're a widow or you're not remain as you are and serve the lord um, and, uh, and God has a way of, of blessing us as we do that. My friends, I hope and pray that you've uh, learned something today. It's helped in your walk with God. Perhaps it's challenged you. Uh, there's a whole lot coming here from the Apostle Paul. Again, the importance of marriage for Paul cannot be underestimated. And in that, the importance of, of serving God. Uh, whether married or not, but being faithful to him really comes out. I trust you continue to do that. Don't give up on him. We live in a world that is pulling us in 50,000 different directions. Uh, 
you do your best to stay faithful with him. I'll try to do the same thing too. And we're, we'll, you know, we'll go on that canoe together. God bless you. Keep you. Look forward to seeing you again uh, next session. Uh, take care.